today we're going to do something that, if you think about it, is really amazing. And that is that we're going to honor our Lord Jesus Christ the way they've been doing, Christians have been doing, for 2,000 years. The unbroken chain. And sometimes I think we come to the Lord's Supper and we've forgotten the magnificence of it. And we've forgotten the sobriety of it. We've forgotten how impactful the Lord's Supper is. And can you imagine going back 2,000 years ago when those very first early church Christians were observing the Lord's Supper, what they must have thought. Somehow, I hope that we can go back in time a little bit and remember fresh and new what Jesus Christ has done for us and the sacrifice that he has made. And I pray that this morning's Lord's Supper won't be just any old Lord's Supper, but it will be fresh to all of us. There's some denominations that they observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing in the Bible that says how often to do it. It just says, as often of you do it, remember me. The reason that Baptists do it usually once a quarter is because we were afraid or concerned it might become just something you do, you know, to get it over with. So I want us to really imagine what it was like for those early church Christians and really go back in time and really think about our Lord and all that he has done and is doing for us. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll look at verse 23 right now. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that this particular Lord's Supper will be fresh and new to every one of us. And may we be reminded by the power of your Holy Spirit of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. And I pray, Father, that as we observe this supper, every heart will be searched by the Holy Spirit. And may we respond that during the time of invitation as you would have us respond. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Sometimes I sit around and I think about these weird things when I'm preparing a sermon. And so I began to wonder, people who are on death row, what did they ask for when they asked for their last supper? The title of the message this morning is The Lasting Last Supper. So what do these certain people ask for when they're thinking about, this is what I want to eat for the very last supper that I have? There's a man by the name of Gary Gilmore, you may be familiar with that name, probably not, I wasn't. But he was the first man that was executed after the death penalty was reinstated in 1977. What did he ask for? What did he want as his last meal? He wanted hamburgers, plural, eggs, potatoes, and bourbon. He must have been a Methodist. Ted Bundy, I know you've heard of Ted Bundy, a serial killer in Florida. In 1989, he was put to rest, if you will, and he was asking or asked for a burrito and some Mexican rice. You know, God forbid I ever wind up on death row, but if I do, I'm going to ask for Mexican food. That's my favorite. Timothy McVeigh, who was the mastermind behind the Oklahoma City bombing. As you recall, I was pastoring at First Baptist Nicoma Park during the bombing, and we lost five of our church members. What did he ask for? Two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream. That's all he wanted. Nothing else. John Wayne Gacy, you're probably familiar with him, a serial killer. He murdered 33 young men, if you will. Can you imagine? He wanted Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I thought when I read that, they must not have had a Popeye's where he was at. 
fried shrimp, french fries, strawberries, and a Diet Coke. And then Walter Legrand, whom I never had heard of, was executed in 1999. He must have had a voracious appetite because he asked for six fried eggs, 16 strips of bacon, hash browns, a pint of pineapple ice cream, breakfast steak, a cup of ice, 7-Up, Dr. Pepper, Coke, hot sauce, coffee, sugar packs, and four roll aids. <laughs> well, today we think about the Last Supper of Jesus. There he is in the upper room. He's surrounded by his disciples, including the one who would betray him. Can you imagine the intensity of that room where they didn't really understand what Jesus was trying to symbolize for them when he broke the bread, when he drank the wine? They weren't really sure what he was talking about, but they probably got a hint at least that Jesus is about to die for us. This is what's going on. This is what he's talking about. Well, I believe in this story, true story of the upper room, Last Supper, that there's a word from God for every one of us. And I think if we'll open up our hearts and our imaginations for just a little while, we might just see the, new, the Lord's Supper in a new and fresh way and what it is that God wants us to learn today, what he's teaching us. So I want to share with you a few things if you want to take notes and write these down. First of all, reflecting on the cross. What do we think about when we take the Lord's Supper? We're supposed to be reflecting on the cross. Look again at verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I read that and... For some reason, I started thinking about remembering things, remembering people. When I started thinking about remembering people, I thought about my loved ones. How many of you have a loved one who's in heaven right now? Would you raise your hand? I thought about my daddy who died when he was only 43 years old. My brother Glenn, who was 49. My sister Linda, who was only 50 when she passed away. I think of my mom. When she passed away. And I remember all those good things about being with them. Do you? Do you remember going to Thanksgiving or maybe to Christmas and being with your family and celebrating and having fun and laughing and telling jokes and rem reminiscing yourself as you're with your family? And maybe as an adult, you didn't get to see them very often, but when you did get to see them, it was a lot of fun to see your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, uncles, cousins, your mom, your dad. So I think about all those wonderful, joyful times that we had, but also it's kind of a mixed bag because I think about, in my sister's case, Linda, who died of cancer, her, the end of her life. Linda was an incredible lady. She wasn't living for God earlier in her adult life, but she got saved, and when she got saved, she got saved. You know what I'm saying? I remember toward the end of her life how much she suffered. Her hair all fell out. Her skin was peeling off. And yet she still had the most incredible attitude and spirit of anyone I guess I've ever seen in my life that was going through such a thing. And she loved Jesus. She loved the Lord. She loved her family. She loved her friends. She loved her church. She was just a woman whose heart was filled with Jesus. And then I remember her inevitable death. I'd gotten word from my sister Connie that Linda's going to pass any time now. Rick Bailey has a brother-in-law who owns a small airplane, seats a four-passenger, I believe. And so he agreed to fly me to Fort Worth. We got to the airport as quickly as we could at Hooks Airport and got up in the air and we're flying. He's flying that thing as fast as that, as that plane would go to get me there because I wanted to be there before my sister passed away. We landed the plane. We're taxiing down the runway we got in the car, and my phone rings, and it's my little sister, Connie, and she said, Linda's gone. And I just remember feeling crushed. I wanted to see her one last time. 
So when I remember them, it's a mixed bag, isn't it? When you remember the Lord, it also is a mixed bag of emotions because we remember the sadness that he went through and the stress that he went through and the shame and humiliation that Jesus went through for us. We remember all of those things, but at the same time, we're grateful for the life that he lived and and thankful for what Jesus has done. And my heart is filled with joy because for us as believers, some might look at the cross and say that's a horrible, tragic thing, and it is and was, but it's also the symbol of our saving grace. And I'm thankful and joyful for the cross. Are you? Had it not been for the cross, we'd have no hope this morning. Let's thank the Lord for what he's done. The death of Jesus was the final sacrifice because the Bible teaches us that he died once and for all. Prior to that, there were animal sacrifices. But Jesus, God's only begotten son, comes and he dies for the sin of mankind. And he was the perfect sinless sacrifice. Never did he have a sinful thought. Never did he ever commit any sin. There was not one iota, not one smidgen of sinfulness in him. So he died the perfect sacrifice for you and for me, the sinless lamb of God. So let his death cause us to reflect this morning. And we remember his life. I think about the teachings of Jesus that we read about in the Bible, and there are at least two things that rise to the surface. One is his great love, and didn't Jesus love? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, right? Jesus loved us enough to come. Jesus and God are one and the same. He loved us enough to come and to suffer and to die on the cross for us. And then when he was here, he loved people. He loved people into a relationship with God. He demonstrated that love each and every day of his life because he was full of love. But another thing that you obviously have to concentrate on when you think about his life was the theme of forgiveness because he forgave. He forgave us. Not one of us in this room is worthy of God's forgiveness. No, not one. And yet the Bible teaches us that God loves us so much that if we'll ask him, now, Pastor, you don't know how sinful I've been and you don't know how bad I've been. Let me tell you something by the authority of God's word. I don't care how sinful you've been. I don't care how bad you've been. There's not one sin that if you'll confess it to God that he won't forgive. His heart was full of forgiveness. His heart was full of love. And then we think about his sacrifice. Not only what he taught us, but then we think about his sacrifice, the weight of the cross. Can you imagine how heavy that cross must have weighed? He had already been beaten. He had already been ridiculed and mocked. He had already lost blood. He has his cross on his back. It was so weighty and he was so weak that he collapsed under the weight of the cross. You remember another man picked it up and took it the rest of the way to Golgotha for him. And then we think about not only that cross, but that crown of thorns shoved down upon his head. Can you imagine the amount of blood that was coming and streaming down his face from that crown of thorns alone? Any of you here ever had a head wound? You ever had that happen to you? I've had. I've had several. I had a horse that yanked me into a tree. God rest her soul. (laughs) Got 16 stitches right up here. Knocked me out when she did it. I had a buddy of mine named Ronnie, and we were in the back room of the greatest grocery store of them all, and you know what it is, Piggly Wiggly. And I was talking to another friend named Mike, and we were like facing him. He was facing me. I was facing Mike this way, and there was a little gap between us. We're in the back room of the store. Ronnie thought it would be funny. He was about 30 feet away to throw a full Coke can between us, make it hit the concrete wall and explode on us. And that was back in the days before you could easily crush a Coke can. Remember those? He chunked it, and when he chunked it, he realized that he was off target So he yells, watch out, and I turn like this. I never saw it coming. I have a scar right here on my face. You probably never noticed it, but I had 16 stitches right here as well. And then when I was a kid, we were playing grenades. You ever play grenades when you were a kid, playing Army? 
throwing rocks, blowing each other up. And then one of them decided to throw a screwdriver. Hit me right here. I know what you're thinking, Pastor. It's amazing you are alive. But I can remember all of the blood that would just gush out and gush out. And here's Jesus, our Lord and Savior, this crown of thorns thrust down upon his head. Remember as he was hanging on the cross, a soldier took a sword and pierced his side. And he bled out a mixture of blood and water. All of the ridicule, all of the mocking, all of the shame. The artist is very kind because when Jesus hung on the cross, he didn't have anything on, nothing. Nothing. Can you imagine what it was like for him to go through all of that knowing, as the old hymn says, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't because he died for us. And then perhaps the worst thing of all, when Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible says he took upon himself the sins of the world, past, present, and future All of the sins of the world he took upon himself. And at that moment, what happened? God turned his back upon his only begotten son because God is holy and God cannot look upon sin. And that's why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Can you imagine the anguish that he felt when his heavenly father, his father, turned his back so this morning when we take the Lord's Supper we remember what he did he he left heaven to be born a human why did he do that he became poor so you and I could, could become rich and he bore our sins on the cross and he took our place it should have been us on Calvary's tree but he took our place on Calvary he shed his blood why for our redemption and he conquered death forever when he did all of that The second point might sound strange to you at first, but it's got a point. He gave us tools in which to remember him. Tools in which to remember him. In verse 23, the Lord Jesus took some bread, then he broke it in pieces. He took the cup of non-alcoholic wine. That's what it says in the Baptist Bible, right? Have you ever noticed that sometimes you look at something and then all of a sudden you remember stuff about that thing. My brother Glenn that I mentioned passed away was a woodworker. I'm a woodworker. In fact, I'm going to assemble Paxton's crib today, which I have built, and I'll finish it today. And good news, Paxton got to come home. Praise the Lord. Three months in the hospital. I'm a little late on the crib, but I got a sneaking suspicion that he won't be sleeping in that until he's 16 or 17 if Chelsea has anything to do with it. I've got a couple of Glenn's pieces that he made in my home, and I look at those, and every time I see them, I'm, I'm reminded of Glenn. He made a bench that opens up, and you put storage in it. It's in, in our kitchen area, and, and I think of Glenn when I see that. He made this, this curio cabinet thing that I think of Glenn when I see that. He was a hunter. He loved to hunt. He loved to fish. After he passed away, Gayla, his wife, gave me a couple of Glenn's guns. I've never shot them, probably never will. But every once in a while, I'll get them out and I'll just look at him and I think about all the good times Glenn had with that gun, shooting all of God's creatures. I think about my mom. My mom loved to bake. There's sometimes I go into somebody's house or I go into a bakery and something I, I see, something I smell. And smell is a very powerful reminder, isn't it? I smell something and it just brings me right back to my mom, the way her house would smell at Thanksgiving time, at Christmas time, and any time that baby boy came home. I think about her specialty, which was chocolate gravy. I told you about that. I can't believe how many of you sent me recipes to chocolate gravy. Have you tried it yet? If you haven't, you need to get saved. My dad, who passed away when he was just 43 years old, I was only six years old, but he was a woodworker, and uh, he had a garage full of tools. I was too young to really use any of those tools, but I do remember going and hanging out in the garage with my dad, and, and one particular tool he had that was 
really interesting to me was a, a vice clamp. It, 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 you screwed down on the bench. You know what I'm talking about? It was a bench vice clamp. And I would take it and spin it like that. It would close the jaws. I'd go the other way and open them up. And every once in a while I'd put something in there like one of my sister's dolls and smashed her head. You know? So when I, I've got a garage full of tools. And a lot, a lot of times when I'm out there working, I think about my dad. And maybe that's why I love doing woodworking so much. I, I think about my sister Linda. My brother Wendell has a place out at Hilton Head Island, and, and Linda used to love to go there and walk the beach, and just pick up seashells and look at the ocean, watch the seagulls. Sometimes she would feed them. She loved butterflies. So anytime I'm in Hilton Head at my brother's place, I walk on the beach, and I, I think about how Linda loved that so much. Or, or when a butterfly flutters by, I, I think about how much my sister loved butterflies and hummingbirds. She loved them both. The Last Supper has some elements, some things, if you will. Have you ever asked yourself the question, I wonder when Jesus, you know, was about to ascend into heaven, why didn't he just say, hey, y'all don't forget me, because see, Jesus was a Texan at heart. Y'all don't forget me. He said, remember me. And then he gave us these elements in which to remember him. He, he picked up a piece of bread, the Bible says, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he picked up the cup of wine and he drank it. And they all drank it. He said, this is my blood, which will be shed for you. And then he was sitting at a table. And I, I never have thought about this until this particular Lord's Supper time when I was writing the sermon, he was sitting at a table, and you know what that represents? His availability. He's available. He will sit down and sup with you. Can you imagine what it's going to be like one of these days when we have that great feast up in heaven? <laughs> and we get to eat at a great big old table with Jesus. I hope I get to sit next to him, but I'll just be happy to sit at any table he sits at, right? How incredible. I, I remember when I went to my first president's breakfast. I, I never had been to one before. It was when President Bush was president, and I never had been one before, and I was going to go eat breakfast with the president. I thought, man, that's awesome. Like, I'd be sitting there at the table, and I'd say, hey, can you pass the salt? <laughs> that Mr. President? I didn't know it was like this gigantic room with thousands of people in it. But somehow I think when we get to heaven and get to sup with Jesus, we'll all feel that personal connection with him. Like we're sitting right next to him, even if we're not. Amen. So when we think about this meal, we need to think about the humanness of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. And he was a human. He was all human. He was all God all at the same time. How does that happen? I don't know. You'll have to ask him one day. But I know he was all human and he felt what we felt. And he felt pain and he felt shame. He felt humiliation. He felt all of those things. And yet he died for us anyway. His sacrifice was not it was not easy. Another thing we see is I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of him. Look verse 26. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. This triggered some questions in my mind. Am I ashamed of Jesus? Well, do my family members know that I love Jesus? Do yours? Do our co-workers know that we love Jesus? Do your neighbors know that you love Jesus? Do your classmates know that you love Jesus? Do they know this? And if they don't know that, why not? Why in the world would we keep our salvation a secret? Are we embarrassed? Are we insecure about it? Is that why we do it? Why would we keep it a secret? Or maybe we fall in for the lie that religion is personal. That's a lie. There are some in the liberal persuasion that are trying to convince us that it should not be freedom of religion but freedom of worship. Let me tell you why. The world does not care so long as we keep what we believe about God in these four walls. But religion says go outside of these four walls. Practice what you say you believe and tell the world about Jesus. That's what it says to us. So I would say stand up for Jesus. Shout it out that you've been born again. Share with you before I... When I was a student at Oklahoma Baptist University, I had a buddy. We're going to go to Arby's. He felt like spending a lot of money that day. And he brought a buddy with him. And on the way, you know, when we were walking by ourselves, he said, hey, whatever you do, do not ask him to pray when we get to Arby's. Don't ask him to bless the food. Don't ask him to do that. 
You know what I did. I said, I can't remember his name now. I think it was Carl. I said, Carl, would you like to, to bless the food? And he said, oh, I'd be glad to. He stood up. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a student at Oklahoma Baptist University. I love the Lord Jesus. And I'm about to ask him to bless the food that we're going to partake in. And if you haven't already done that, you bow your heads, I'll pray for you too. And everybody in the Arby's went. <laughs> Amen. One thing for sure, he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. Amen. So be bold for God. Declare the gospel. Tell of his death. Celebrate his resurrection. Lead others to saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. There's another thing. One of these days, we're all going to see him face to face. Can you imagine that day when you walk through the pearly gates and whatever stars you may have gotten in your crown, your, your first instinct is going to be, let me see Jesus. And when you get there, you're going to kneel at his feet and take that crown off and lay it at his feet. Notice what it says in verse 26. You are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. See, Jesus made a promise. He said, I, I'm leaving. I'm going to ascend to sit at the right hand of my heavenly Father. But one of these days, I'm coming again for the church. In the last days, I'm coming back. Your pastor believes that we're living in the last of the last days. I think he could come at any moment. Jesus could come again. In fact, I believe it so much that I've asked Charles, if the rapture occurs before I finish the sermon, I've asked him to finish the sermon for me. <laughs> so my question is, are you ready? If he were to come back today, are you ready? Do you know that you know that you know that you've been born again and you're ready to meet him face to face? Now, all of this means that we need to take a spiritual checkup. Look at verse 27. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. What is it saying there? Don't partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily. Do you see that in verse 27? Don't do it. What does this mean? If you've never been saved, don't take the Lord's Supper. If you've never been born again, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins and be the Lord and Master of your life and Savior, then don't take the Lord's Supper. If you're living in a backslidden state, I, there was a time in my life I was closer to God than I am right now and I don't even care. I've backslidden. I'm away from him. And I have no conviction that I need to make things right. Then the Bible says don't take the Lord's Supper. Now, let me clarify something. I had a man at my last church, and he said, I'll never take the Lord's Supper because I'm never going to be worthy. He was a Christian. He was a believer. He said, I just can't take the Lord's Supper because I'm not worthy. Let me ask you a question. Who of us is worthy? There are none righteous, no, not one. We only become worthy because of the shed blood of Jesus over our sins, his forgiveness. And then we are worthy before God, not because of what we've done or haven't done, but because of what Jesus did for us. We become worthy. So I'm not saying don't take the Lord's Supper because you feel like you're unworthy. I'm saying if you've been saved and you know it and you're trying your very best to live for God, all of us are still sinners, right? Anybody here not a sinner, raise your hand. You're a sinner. All of us are sinners. So none of us are ever going to be worthy of partaking in the Lord's Supper. That means we have to ask the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts. It says in verse 31, but if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. So we ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come into my heart, into my life, and examine every room, every crevice, every corner if there's anything there I need to confess to you, I want to confess it before I participate in the Lord's Supper. I want to remind you this morning that Jesus Christ is not a way to God. He's the only way to God. Listen to these verses of Scripture. Amen. 
nor is there any or, nor is there salvation under any other name. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. There is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. You're not going to be saved because of your good behavior. You're not going to be saved because you give money to the church. You're not going to be saved because you're a Baptist. You're not going to be saved any way other than trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior.